This is the Global Information Network. It's January 1st, 2050. And here, to mark the 50th anniversary of the Planetary Management Authority, is James Burke. Konnichiwa. I wonder if I could ask you to take a look at something. Archive. By 2005, 40 million are dead of starvation. 2015 and three quarters of the world's tropical rainforest. The summer of 2020 brings hurricane strength storms. In 2022, a subsidence caused by sea level rise. Epidemics rage in New York. Toxic waste spills throughout Europe. Full scale evacuation is ordered in New Orleans. Greater temperature increases are still to come. I found out the other day in some old library. It's a videotape from 1990, and that was how they thought we'd turn out. Funny how they missed out some of the changes we would really care about. I mean, do you remember hamburgers, traffic jams, log fires in winter, a place called Miami, a time when the Japanese weren't running everything? That world has disappeared so fast, hasn't it, that we're all still living in a kind of future shock. But we're only going to adapt by understanding what caused it, why climate change really happened back in the 20th century. So I'm going to show you why, with the aid of some state-of-the-art 2050s technology that I think you're going to enjoy. This technology, standby mode. I'm not in reality. I'm in the Planetary Management Authority's latest virtual reality generator. The database here has got a detailed working model of the entire world that the PMA uses to test out planetary management scenarios on, with simulations of anywhere so real, you can do things to them as if they were real. I'm going to use a generator like this to recreate times and places from the distant past up through the 20th century to today to look at what happened when technology first began to change the planet. When what we did started to change the weather instead of the other way round. The greenhouse effect, in other words. And how the greenhouse effect scare forced them to make decisions that would radically alter the way we run the world and that would give us the life we lead today in the second half of the 21st century after the warming. Several million years ago, a massive and prolonged drought in Africa drives our very distant ancestors out of the trees and onto the grasslands. And those of us who happen to be able to walk upright stay alive, because we can see food and enemies over the top of the grass. Those who can't become history. Well, prehistory. By about 70,000 BC, we've moved north out of Africa, and we're living in caves from Kelani to Vladivostok, almost human, living on a diet of mostly mammoth and berries. And then the weather turns disastrously cold, and life in the cave becomes iffy, to say the least. With all that lousy weather, the vegetation out there becomes pretty stunted, and so there's a lot less mammoth around on the hoof. But you've still got to eat. Which is why this chilly climatic event probably triggered the most important thing in our history up to the advent of sliced bread, because it favours a previously unimportant characteristic some of us have. Some of us, from time to time, give the odd helpful grunt while showing each other how to chip flint tools like these. And then we start to use the grunt for something else. We start to grunt about catching the mammoth, or about the hunting strategy lessons we've started to put up on the wall. So, thanks to this change in the weather, we invent the basic way for dealing with every problem from then on show and tell. <laughs> 
that and every other major event in human history has to do with the weather and the greenhouse effect is because both of them have a big effect on living conditions on the planet. For instance, really serious changes in the weather depend on how far we are from the sun. And every 100,000 years, that changes because the shape of the Earth's orbit changes. And then every 41,000 years, the Earth tilts back and forwards towards or away from the sun. And when it's tilted away, the ice caps get a lot colder. So when the Earth is farther from the sun in orbit and tilted away, it gets so cold you have yourself an ice age. The greenhouse effect kind of runs things in between those ice ages. The effect is caused by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, like carbon dioxide, that stop the sun's heat from radiating back out into space. More greenhouse gas, it gets warmer, less cooler. How much gas there is depends on trillions of little plants floating in the ocean surface that breathe in tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere every year. If the weather cools down, the little plants die off. With most of them gone, more carbon dioxide gets left in the atmosphere, so the planet warms up again. When it's warm enough, the little plants multiply again. So in between ice ages, the plants act like a kind of planetary thermostat, switching us between warm and cool. Well, for several billion years, these climatic ups and downs bother only dinosaurs, mudfish, and other prehistoric non-entities. Until, as I mentioned, we turn up and eventually learn to talk during the last ice age. Now, they reckon that it took only a few thousand years for that clever language trick to spread among humans all around the planet. Well, almost all around. There were a couple of places we hadn't been able to get to. There again, the weather took a hand. I said that one of the things the last ice age did was to force us to leave home in search of food. The other thing it did was to freeze the seawater into ice. So the sea level went down between 50 and 15,000 years ago by more than 300 feet. So that search for food drove some of those eco-refugees, the ones whose descendants we call American Indians, out of their caves in Siberia, across the valley that is now the Bering Straits, to Alaska, to go on and settle America all the way down to Chile. The other place the same kind of walkabout happened was here, where the prehistoric travelers migrated across a wide plain with rolling hills and a great lake, walking from New Guinea to Australia, across what is now the bottom of the Gulf of Carpentaria. And then around 15,000 BC, the weather switched again. The world warmed up an average nine degrees, the ice melted, the seas came back up and flooded in, and there they were, Americans, or in this case, Australians, for good. As the planet went on heating up, the sea level went on rising, carving out the Gulf of Mexico and Hudson's Bay, flooding the North European plain and creating the British Isles, and filling the Gulf of Suez, maybe even originating the biblical flood story. When it was over, there was the modern world. But as the seas rose, so did the rivers and lakes. So with high temperatures and plenty of moisture, around the world's great rivers in America, India, China, and the Middle East, the land became incredibly fertile. Back then, with all the holiday weather and loads of water around and with wheat and barley growing everywhere, they were out of their caves and running farming villages in a relative flash. The most spectacular effects of all this hot stuff 
happened here in the Middle East, sometime around 7,000 BC, probably in Iraq. They were farming so much grain they had a surplus that you could swap for things like sheep or cows. So to save them having to heave real sheep or real sacks of corn around to do deals with, they started just using tokens to represent them. Then they started pressing the tokens onto a wet clay tablet to make marks to represent, say, the tokens for three sheep and three cows. Those marks were the first ever writing. One of mankind's greatest inventions, triggered by good farming weather. And as writing spread, so did the trading it was designed for. And then around 3000 BC, this happened. Massive droughts all over the Mediterranean, catching the new agri-business crowd, so to speak, with their populations rising. In the case of Egypt, the whole country turned into desert except the strip of land on either side of the Nile, kept fertile by the river's annual life-giving floods. Well, the choice for the Egyptians was easy. Either you organized a way to save every drop of those annual life-giving floods, or you were a dead duck. Which is why this particular change in the weather is so uniquely meaningful, because it, well, generated civilization. Which is what saving water turned out to be. Because when you can organize that, you can organize anything. All those ancient civilizations were kicked off by everything that came with running a water supply. Math, to design the irrigation network. Surveying and engineering to lay it out. Mud and straw bricks to build it. Geometry to measure reservoir volume. Metallurgy to make the tools. A calendar to get the river flood date right. Management to run it all. Tax collectors to cream off the profits. And a state bureaucracy to spend them. And when the ancient Egyptians had got themselves all that, they built themselves all this. The great temple complex of Karnak up the Nile. The most spectacular thing in the ancient world. There are 140 of these giant columns, and this is just one corner in the largest temple ever built at the imperial city of Thebes on the banks of the Nile. The Egyptians called this the chosen place. What had happened was that the weather had changed them from groups of freewheeling individuals into a hierarchical society with rigid rules all ultimately dictated by the weather just like the Planetary Management Authority and us today in 2050. Then, just like we do now, they got worry lines from watching what the weather would do next. That's why all over the public buildings, they went on and on about the Nile. This climate change forced the ancient Egyptians to develop civil engineering techniques to tackle the local problem of flooding from the Nile. Today, in 2050, we tackle the global problem of flooding from the sea with exactly the same techniques. The next major weather change generated a historical whodunit. What happened to the great lost civilization of Mycenae, described by Homer as the golden city of heroes, who ran the Mediterranean in 1300 BC and who won the Trojan War? Well, they might have done a bit better if they'd had a weather forecast. And since one of the things this machine is exceptionally good at is simulating weather patterns, take a look at a rerun of what the Mycenaeans had coming. Because of the drop in temperature and growing ice cap, the polar front will weaken, and the westerly Mediterranean winds are going to push further north. Here's the usual Atlantic storm track that brings wet summers to southeastern Europe and carries its rain on down into the eastern Mediterranean. But now, because of these Mediterranean winds, the system will stall in mid-Europe instead of heading on southeast. And you'll get really major precipitation here in the Hungarian plains. 
so you can look for a catastrophic flood watch there for several decades, so people there should head east for safety. Meanwhile, further south, the only rain around now will be brought in by the Mediterranean weather system. But, unlike the old high-altitude Atlantic storm tracks, this one's down low, so it'll bump up against the mountains of western Greece and dump all its rain. Which means that from 1200 BC, for maybe a century, you're not going to see any rain at all, beyond the western Greek mountains and throughout this entire area. And where was Mycenae? Right there, on the dry side of those mountains. Sure enough, within one generation of the fall of Troy in 1200 BC, and the start of that catastrophic drought, the Mycenaeans had abandoned their palaces and cities, and thanks to a change in the weather, disappeared without trace. A thousand years later, disappearing without trace, down this secret, mile-long, 300-foot-deep ravine through a mountain, was a favorite stunt of a shifty bunch of Middle Eastern moneybags called the Nabataeans, the original hole-in-the-wall gang. That they were able to pull this particular vanishing trick was due to yet another spectacular degree improvement in the world's weather. But before I explain, take a sneaky look at what it was they were hiding down at this end of the ravine. Just round that corner. Down here, totally hidden, in what is now modern Jordan, surrounded by all this fancy architecture, lived 30,000 people with shops, factories, baths, homes, and law courts. And in the middle of a barren desert, all the food and drink they could ever need. Impressive, no? And all because of the weather. And as this seems an apt setting to put the whole vaguely theatrical story into proper perspective, let me give you the big picture meteorology-wise. Around 300 BC, the climate goes warm and moist. Tons of food everywhere, calm seas, great traveling weather. And most important, in northern Italy, the Alpine mountain passes now stay open all year round. This arrangement proves irresistible to the ancient Romans, who promptly rush out and kind of take over. From Portugal to the Persian Gulf, Scotland to the Sahara, the known world. After a while, they bump into another bunch, the Chinese, doing exactly the same thing for the same climatic reason in their known world. Because the good weather has also opened up the Silk Road and the sea routes from the Far East. So regular trading begins between the two superpowers. And guess who are set to make oodles of boodle as middlemen because they're sitting at what the history books always for some reason call a crossroads there. Yes, our friends here, the nifty Nabataeans. Up the trade routes from China and India come caravans of sugar, ginger, silk, parrots, elephant's teeth, frankincense and myrrh. Down the other way goes damask from Damascus, gauze from Gaza, as well as asbestos, bitumen and other special offers, all masterminded from Nabatean HQ. This hole in the ground, alias the fabled city of Petra. Fabled because being a hole in the ground, entirely surrounded by mountains with only one way in, down that ravine, most people didn't even know it was here, which suited the Petrans to a T. Living down a hole was no problem for the Petrans, because apart from being hot-shot entrepreneurs, they were also the world's greatest plumbers. See this groove? It carried a clay water pipe, and it ran all the way down the ravine, down to the city, and then it fanned out along similar grooves cut into every cliff face, carrying the plentiful rainfall all over the city into big reservoirs, so that there would be water in the one month a year it didn't rain. Who knows how long they might have lasted here, living in their self-contained biosphere, nipping outside only from time to time to make serious amounts of money, 
living a life so like ours in 2050. Lush, but limited. If it hadn't been for the bloody weather again. Because around 500 AD, guess what? The global temperature went down once more. Now, all over the Roman Empire, that meant different things to different people in different places. And none of it good. For example, way up in Northern Europe, for your average sun-loving Italian legionary on overseas posting, it began to get a bit drafty around the skirt. But it wasn't the now regular blizzards and junk howling across the sky that wrote Finis to the Pax Romana. It was that different things to different people stuff I mentioned. Because for a bunch of uncouth sheep herders called the Huns in Central Asia, the climate change meant freezing drought. And that did cause the fall of Rome, because the Huns promptly upped sticks and moved in on their neighbours, who moved in on their neighbours, who moved in on their neighbours, causing a whole load of barbarian tribes to shunt out of Asia right over the Roman Empire, thus giving birth to the domino theory and the Dark Ages. Meanwhile, back here in the mountains of Petra, never mind the geopolitics, all they knew was it stopped raining. The plumbing stopped working, the caravans stopped coming, and appropriately, in the arid conditions that were to obtain here from then on, the place became deserted. Five hundred years later, the temperature jumps and good times are back again. This time, for a bunch of travelling crazies called the Vikings. Here, in the Arctic wastes of Greenland. Up to this time, world's least visited place. In 982, a Viking called Eric the Red came here to Greenland because with all the warmth, the Atlantic pack ice had melted so it wasn't difficult also because he was on the run. He called this place Greenland because it was grassy and went back to get some friends. In 986, 14 ships and 500 settlers landed here, together with assorted pigs, horses, cows, sheep, goats, and the whole shebang, and set up two Greenland colonies on the west coast. Anyway, with the long, warm summers, there was plenty of pasturage and hay for the animals throughout the winter. For fun, the Greenlanders played dice and board games. They lived in turf houses, and they each had their own spoon. They had two serious problems. One of them was wood. As you can see, there isn't any. So, in 1002, Eric's son, Leif Eric's son, set off west with 35 men, and came back a year later with a load of timber from a trip down Baffin land to Labrador and maybe even as far as New England. These trips became a regular event with people even building houses and wintering over in Vinland, as they called America. Then around 1300 the temperature dropped again. By 1351, the sea ice was so thick, the route to Iceland was blocked. By 1350, there was only one settlement left alive here, and the final trading ship came in 1361. The last news to reach the outside world was in 1408. About a wedding in this church. And then, silence. <laughs> 
centuries later, a few of the Greenlanders were dug up, frozen stiff where they had been buried, and that revealed their second problem. They'd only eat meat and dress in European clothes. So when it got very, very cold, they didn't imitate the Eskimos, wear sealskin, eat fish. So they froze and starved. Who knows if they had adapted, as we did, for instance, when we stopped eating beef around 2020 to help prevent deforestation, the Vikings in Greenland might have survived. And a hundred years later, Columbus would have had to learn Danish. Okay, the next major weather change triggered another one of those solutions to a climate problem that we would end up using ourselves, too. This time, it was handling a temperature change with technology. Take a look at this 16th century art, and you'll see what I mean. As you can see, this is an old master, a winter scene. You know why that's such a big deal? Because painting the winter was a new thing. Because here, we're in the Little Ice Age, the beginning of which froze out those Greenlanders, and caused the kind of extreme changes in lifestyle that a European old master would bother to paint. Because this painting contains the new artificial environment technology. This, their high-tech answer to the new cold weather, the new style, weatherized manor house of the period. Admire the new features. Stone walls and gravel surrounds to keep out the wet and the mud. No more open colonnades and courtyards. Steep roofs and guttering to handle a lot of rain. But in spite of the cold, they still put in big glass windows. That's because this change in the weather was to trigger the use of a new technology that would turn houses from medieval barns into something you and I would recognize. There's a particularly good example of it up there. It changed their lives almost as much as greenhouse technology has changed ours. It was the chimney. Look what it did to them. At one stroke, it drove the social classes apart. Where they all used to eat and sleep together, around one central fire in the great main hall, they now split up, living separately in small heated rooms. They kept out the drafts with new tricks like tapestry, plasterwork, panelling, curtains. Enjoying the new privacy with curtained four-poster beds, where love took on a new romantic meaning. They even bathed more because they could do it in front of the fire. And now the house was warm enough for them to put in the flashiest of household consumer items. Big windows. Some of the aristocratic houses had small heated offices in them so the accounts could be kept and the estate administration could go on throughout the year instead of stopping in December when the ink froze. So the economy picked up. All in all, the new indoor life was pretty elegant. New indoor amusements became all the rage, like making your own music. All that to keep them nice and warm. Funny thought, isn't it, from our point of view? Which reminds me, of all the stuff I've shown you, by far the most meaningful to us in our greenhouse world is what you're about to see. This was when it happened, when the first man-made greenhouse effect began in 18th century England, because this was when the climate stopped doing things to us, and we started doing things to it. With a jump in global average temperature of, oh, maybe four degrees, by 1750, England had had three decades of the most knockout corn-growing weather in maybe a thousand years. So the millers, and everybody else, were up to the rears in bread, in every sense of the word. The effect of this change would eventually turn us from farmers into factory workers and for the first time give us the power to change the weather 
See, the rising temperature brought hot, moist summers and mild winters. And you remember that all-year-round estate management I mentioned? Well, that had paid off with real developments in agricultural techniques. Bigger harvests and a crop yield four times what it had been. So the price of food dropped like a stone. And bigger harvests also meant more work, so people made more money. Now, when wages go up and prices go down, historically people get married much earlier and have many more children. So the population went up like a rocket. So now you had a lot of newlyweds with a lot of money to spend and a lot of houses to furnish. What a market for household goods. Which is what struck the guy who set up this place in Colebrookdale, Abraham Darby. And I suppose he's one of the two key people who gave us the problem we live with in 2050. Back then, Derby was profitably into cast iron cooking pots because with all those extra mouths to feed, you couldn't get rid of them fast enough. Derby's problem was making it fast enough and the trouble there was, to melt iron you need wood, firewood, of which England was out. Which is why Derby, well, one of his lads really, came up with a really neat trick. There was tons of coal around here. This place is called Coalbrook Dale. But it had impurities in it and they got into the iron and spoiled it. This, coke, is coal with the impurities burnt out of it and it will make high quality iron just as fast. The iron making industry took to the new idea with all the abandon of an alcoholic in a brewery. And none more so than a fellow who was looking for high quality dependable iron for cylinders that wouldn't crack under pressure for a new thing called a steam engine. Coke made that possible. So all because of that improvement in the weather, Abraham Darby changed the world. Because his idea made possible the development of steam power. And as you'll see, the problems we live with in 2050. because Abraham Darby kicked off the Industrial Revolution and woke everybody up to the colossal profits to be had from manufacturing. Well... Almost everybody. This particular guy was famous for sleeping till noon. But what he did at night? Thomas Alva Edison, Al to his friends. Midnight inventor extraordinaire. He used to say, I can never pick something up without wanting to improve on it. And I suppose in that sense he invented the idea of consumerism. But his real genius lay in finding or creating a gap in the marketplace, then developing a product to fit that gap that he could sell all over the world. Which is why he was the other fellow to give us greenhouse. Because almost single-handedly, Edison invented the idea of the industrial laboratory here at West Orange, New Jersey. And in doing so, invented inventing. One way or another, he and his backroom boys came up with no less than 1,093 different patents on everything from phonographs to automatic pens. But it was this that we in 2050 have most to thank Edison for. Well, not this exactly, but what came with it. Sockets, fuses, relays, meters, switchboards. In other words, the entire electricity supply industry. And not to labour the point, you make electricity by spinning magnets past wire coils. You spin the magnets on a shaft. You spin the shaft with a steam engine. You make the steam by boiling water, and you boil the water by burning... yes. Abraham Darby's modest idea for using coal to make coke to make cooking pots was by now fueling spectacular industrial expansion and in particular, the fastest growing transportation system in history. Railroads. The coal miners absolutely best friends, because you put coal and iron together, and you get what we in 2050 would describe as a vicious circle, and what the people in 1885 are describing as onward and upward.
So I'll run through the process and you decide which description you prefer. You dig coal to make iron, to build railroads, to deliver coal to factories that want more railroads that need more iron made with more coal. So you dig even more coal to make even more iron, to build even more railroads and so on and so on. So up the chimneys of the industrial world went massive amounts of greenhouse making carbon dioxide released by the burning coal. That is, it went up their 20th century chimneys, but as you'll see, into our 21st century atmosphere. However, it wasn't all railroads burning fossil fuel and making carbon dioxide. By 1910, it was what we in 2050 would call international greenhouse lunacy of every kind, thanks to two more Western inventions. Here's the first, the idea of making guns with standard, identical, interchangeable bits, what we call spare parts. Caught on like nobody's business with industry, because with it, you could make zillions of identical components for things, cheap, by the same manufacturing process. So that was the second new Western idea, what we call mass production. Mass production was about to do things to the entire world, because in the West, a rapidly increasing population quit the farms for the factories and the bright lights of the big city for a new way of making money called the working week and the new and irresistible prospect of owning things. And so, consumerism was born, and with it, the expectation that it was a God-given right for people to have more of everything, and then after that, more again. All of which kept the factories and their fossil fuel demand and production lines and materials processing going night and day, every day of the year. But could it go on? Wouldn't they run out of stuff? Well, of course, as you know, they didn't. Because quite early on, while casting about for a solution to the supply problem, they happened to notice that other parts of the world appeared to be positively over-endowed with exactly what was required. Raw materials. And the reason why the Europeans were able to go on having their industrial revolution, go on burning oil and coal, was because unlike any empire that went before, they had the means to make their wishes felt across the entire planet. They had steamships, railways and telegraphs to organize it all, and adequate means of persuasion. And here's how you did it. Say the place you're interested in has mineral resources. First thing you do is to build railroads, but only from the ports to the mines. Then you use the trains to bring in all the equipment you need to remove the minerals, plus all the necessary westerners to run things. You do not build railroads to anywhere else, nor do you train the locals to be managers. Net result, you wipe out what local economy there was, and you put in administration and transportation systems to suit your business, and shape the country to your needs. Of course, once the railroads were in, you didn't have to limit yourself to just taking away all the minerals you could lay your hands on. Alongside the tracks, you put plantations to produce essentials like rubber or cotton, as well as a few extra little luxuries. Pineapples, sugar, tea, coffee, rice, palm oil, coconuts, tobacco, thus creating a profitable new market for these goodies back home. Well, it all seemed to work like an absolute charm. So, massive Western investment poured out to the colonies, and back from their new ports came nice cheap cargoes of rubber from plantations in Malaya, beef from refrigeration plants in Argentina, sugar from refineries in the Caribbean, copper from smelters in Africa, tropical fruit from packers in Central America. Bringing them all, well and truly, into the grip of the industrialized world. This would turn out, as you will see, to cause serious greenhouse grief about a century later. Because what you had created here were banana republics, or tin republics, or copper republics, or whatever. Countries dependent for their survival on one or two products, and their success in the Western marketplace. 
I said the colonies would cause greenhouse problems a hundred years later. But it was what the colonies helped make possible first. Explosive Western industrial growth that would ring alarm bells a lot sooner than that because of the way the West now began to use fossil fuel on a big enough scale to do serious things to the planetary carbon cycle. Let me show you the planetary carbon cycle at work. Oh, sorry, if you were waiting to see something happen, that was it. The carbon cycle at work. Every living organism is part of the carbon cycle. The whole world is full of carbon. Most of it locked up in rocks forever. But several hundred billion tons worth of it is free to move around in the form of a gas, carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas. For instance, every spring, plants breathe it in to help with their growth, and then every autumn, they dump it in the form of dead leaves that rot and release that gas back into the atmosphere. The key to the whole process is out there. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is regulated by the oceans because whenever there's a little excess, they absorb it, keeping the planetary carbon cycle in balance. Well, they used to until the Industrial Revolution and the new lifestyle it created. By the 1950s, when publicity films were hyping consumerism and the electric age that made it all possible, what had really made it all possible, the world's oil fields and coal fields and forests, looked inexhaustible. So these people went on using them as if they were. By 1957, this freewheeling lifestyle was dumping greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, nitrous oxides, CFCs and methane into the atmosphere at a rate of over 5 billion tons a year. And nobody knew it was happening. But they were about to. It was here at the weather station, 11,000 feet up the side of a Hawaiian volcano called Mauna Loa, that they first found out what was actually going on. At the time, people had been looking at ice cores drilled out of the Greenland ice cap, ice cores that contained trapped air bubbles, frozen in the snow that stacked up year after year in ice layers. An annual atmosphere record. And they had 160,000 years of those ice layers. They analyzed all the air in those bubbles and they got this. Over thousands of years, here's the carbon dioxide level in black going up and down. See it? But look, here in blue is the temperature rise, shadowing it almost exactly. And look at this. These two levels linked in the same way over the same period of time to the methane level. See? Up here in mid-Pacific, well away from industrial pollution, from 1958 on, they started measuring the amount of carbon dioxide in the modern atmosphere, and they got this. Down in spring, up in autumn. Spring, autumn, spring, autumn. Remember the plants? But look at the overall trend. Up. Man-made excess, that. Too much for the oceans to absorb. And at the same time, look at methane levels, and another greenhouse gas, CFCs. And look at this. Global temperature rise over the previous hundred years. Well, you didn't need a PhD, especially when you had a look at two other key trends. Fossil fuel emission and deforestation. None of those things was going that way. The scientists dropped their graphs and reached for their diaries to set up some conferences. 1970, climate change. 
72, environment. 74, the ozone layer. 76, greenhouse gases. Then the politicians got involved. 1980, the UN. 81, the White House. 83, the National Academy. 85, UN again. 86, ozone again. 87, environment. 88, a call for action. 89, a call for action. 90, another call for action. 91, another call for action. 92, guess what? And while the talking went on, the data people were producing amazing climate change computer models. You divided the planetary surface up into nearly 2,000 squares and the atmosphere into nine levels. And then at each point where those 17,000 boxes of air joined, you worked out how dozens of constantly varying climatic conditions could interact. With a colossal number of calculations to do, a simulated 10-year run could take a supercomputer 100 hours. And even then, the results were pretty primitive. And not everybody agreed with the end results anyway. The aim of all the models was to work out something we already know, of course. How soon the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere would double, and when we would get global average temperature rises of between 10 and 15 degrees. And that date depended on which computer model you agreed with. 2030, 2050, or 2075. That uncertainty wasn't good enough for some people. We need more research, they said. Maybe it's not going to happen at all. Or if it did, it would take thousands of years, like these things always do. Well, as you know, that turned out to be wrong. What changed everything was a totally unexpected discovery in those ice cores. It was all like a detective story. This is a section of ice core drilled out of the Greenland ice cap, which is always there, whatever the climate. And the air bubbles trapped in the annual ice layers, the older, the deeper you go, contain what happened to be in the air over Greenland at the time. One set of those bubbles revealed something about what the weather could cause that was different in every way from all it had caused throughout history. The development of language, the beginning of civilization, the disappearance of Mycenae, the rise and fall of Rome, the Vikings in America, the great medieval freeze-up, all of that, peanuts. Compared to what the bubbles in this slice of ice core told them. I said that ice core bubbles contain what's in the air at the time, or anything blowing in the wind. 10,720 years ago, when this froze, the wind from Canada started to blow in the pollen of a flower. And as the years went by, more and more came. A new flower was growing over in Canada. The mystery was, it shouldn't have been. That flower only liked extreme cold, and with the last ice age ended, Canada should have been too warm for it. So what had happened here? They found another clue in the same bubble. The composition of the air in them confirmed a catastrophic drop in temperature. But why? The answer to that question came from an entirely different piece of research into how the ocean worked. Because it turned out that's what ran the climate. Watch this. Here's the Gulf Stream flowing on the surface, warming up as it comes through the tropics north up the Atlantic. Around Iceland, the winds evaporate a lot of that water so the water gets saltier. Now, salty water is heavier, so it sinks five billion gallons a second down to the bottom of the Atlantic. Then it flows south, an underwater river 20 times bigger than all the rivers in the world, then east, and then north up the Pacific, where it hits the continents and comes back up to the surface, where it turns south and eventually comes back down through the tropics, heating up as it goes, to become the warm Gulf Stream again. This bit, here in the North Atlantic, where evaporation makes the Gulf Stream so salty that it sinks, is what drives the whole thing. But say that salty water didn't sink. There'd be no more warm Gulf Stream pulled up to fill the gap. And with no more warm Gulf Stream, the temperature up here would drop. So the ice cap would expand, 
with worldwide consequences, just like it did 10,000 odd years ago. But for the Gulf Stream not to sink, it would have had to be less salty. And what on earth could do something on that kind of scale? This did. A giant prehistoric lake in Canada, held back by an ice wall that melted as the planet was warming up after the ice age. So billions of tons of fresh lake water suddenly poured down the St. Lawrence into the Atlantic, making thousands of square miles of ocean surface, Gulf Stream water, too fresh to sink, stopping the entire ocean circulation. So, no more warm Gulf Stream coming north, so a massive fall in temperature, an expansion of the polar cap, ice age conditions worldwide. That was the key to everything. Change the saltiness of the Atlantic, and you change the world's weather. And here was the kicker. I told you the amount of pollen built up gradually as the temperature went from warm back to ice age. I didn't say how long it took. Only 70 years. Back in 1989, when they found that out, they realized something horrendous. If the opposite happened, and the Atlantic became more salty, the temperature might rise just as fast as it had once fallen. But the water would only get more salty if it evaporated more. And that's just what was going to happen when the world warmed up thanks to greenhouse effect. Well, do we have one small flower to thank for what they did with that knowledge? This is the Global Information Minute. It's January 1st, 2050. And here, to mark the 50th anniversary of the Planetary Management Authority, is James Burke. Konnichiwa. This time, I want to use the Management Authority's virtual reality generator to move on and see what happened between 1994 and 2050, and to trace the way the 20th century greenhouse effect scare turned out to be a trigger for something much more important, which is why I'm going to concentrate on what the greenhouse effect did to us and how that led to an entirely new way of managing the entire planet. But first, let me go back to 20th century Greenland for a minute. Back in 1991, things weren't looking so hot, if you see what I mean. Thanks to new atmospheric research and analyzing prehistoric air bubbles trapped in the Greenland ice cap, they'd fingered where the man-made greenhouse effects were coming from. Four main gases in the air. And in 1991, those gases were on the up. Carbon dioxide, that came mostly from burning fossil fuel. Methane, from flatulent cows, paddy fields and garbage. Nitrous oxides, from industry and fertilizers. And CFCs, the most powerful greenhouse gas, used in air conditioners and fridges, spray cans and foam packaging. The big question was, how soon would the greenhouse warm-up start to take effect? That 10 degree drop 11,000 years ago that they'd discovered in those ice cores had thrown the Earth back into an ice age in only 70 years just because of a change in the saltiness of the Gulf Stream. So, would the heat come just as fast? By 1994, when it was realized that global warming might also change the saltiness of the Gulf Stream, there were two things they needed to do urgently. Find out how the ocean would react and do something about the greenhouse effect. The trouble there was they were generating greenhouse gas back then like nobody's business. In pursuit of a lifestyle the West had, East Europe and Russia were about to have, and the Third World wanted as soon as it could get it. 
Look what they were all up to. From the archive. What you're looking at here is the average 20th century oil dependent westerner making greenhouse by throwing the world away after one bite. Dumping a billion pounds of oil based plastic packaging a year. Trashing 600 million trees a year in junk mail and newsprint. Spewing out 140 million tons of carbon emission a year from gas guzzling cars. To us in 2050, all this fancy lifestyle is just so much carbon, methane, nitrous oxides, and CFCs. So back in 1994, that was your great-grandparents sending the Western greenhouse gas levels that way. They were the first bunch. Now for the second bunch, who were about to do more or less the same thing. Up to now, they'd done a pretty good job of generating greenhouse because their technology was old, leaky, energy-intensive, obsolete junk. Back in the old communist world, things were marching to a new tune. Consumerism was now flavor of the month, and so was increased industrial production at any cost. No problem, they were sitting on the world's second biggest coal reserves, already burning a billion tons a year. Pollution you wouldn't believe. Their power stations put out twice the Western carbon levels, and they'd quadrupled output since 1950. And one of the ways they were planning to pay for modernization was by exporting coal. So, their greenhouse gas emission levels were going the same way as the West's. That way. And if you included China, where there was a plan to give every citizen a CFC-making fridge by the year 2000, up was putting it mildly. So what about the third bunch? The Third World, who, as I mentioned, wanted the greenhouse-generating industrial world lifestyle just as soon as they could get their hands on it. Let me just remind you why they were so keen to follow the others into the greenhouse. A hundred years earlier, the West had colonized the Third World to get its hands on the resources the Third World had and the West needed to fuel the Industrial Revolution going on at the time. In almost every case, that meant developing the one resource each colony had, and of course developing absolutely nothing else. So when the colonies became independent, I suppose the last thing you could say they became was independent. Because by 1994, thanks to all that had gone before, here's where they found themselves. if you were just passing through, the places looked okay. But almost everything they had was a Western import. And as for export, well, they were still selling the same old single product. Palm oil, rubber, bauxite, copper, and so on. Still stuck with supplying industrial world markets. And if demand for whatever it was dropped, they were in deep trouble. So they were desperate to diversify, industrialize, provide a Western lifestyle for their own people, if only they could afford it. Fortunately, Western aid was there to bridge the economic gap. Back in the 70s and 80s, you were a third world country, picking up millions of dollars in aid was a piece of cake. Just as long as what you wanted to do was tear up the jungle. So you could then lay roads to haul in all the heavy equipment you would need to build gigantic centralized power stations. More than 90% of all third world aid in those days went for these big energy projects. What you might have wanted big energy for, who might be around out there in the wilds to need it, didn't seem to matter too much. So the third world plan was to use these power stations and roads and such to turn themselves into modern, Western-style, greenhouse-generating, industrial countries with machines, which left only one rather awkward problem 
industrial machinery demanded a few things they, well, didn't happen to have. Like fuel to run the machines, equipment and spare parts to maintain the machines, experts to set up the machines, organization to plan production by the machines, oh, and of course, the machines. That's okay, you buy the stuff. And that's okay, the banks will lend you the money. Because back then in the mid-1970s, the recently very rich Middle East, who have just hiked their oil prices, are absolutely swimming in money that has to be lent to, well, anybody. Which is why by 1994, the third world is 1.2 trillion in debt, and just the interest is costing them a cool 50 billion a year. That's dollars, you note. Hard currency. Which they do not have because their order books are now empty, because the West is slapping big import duties on their goods to protect their own workers. However, the move for modernization has involved massive expenditure on Western luxuries for the urban few, and massive unemployment and starvation for the rural many. People also flood in from the villages to pack the cities, sending the unemployment and birth rates sky high. All that, you're up to here in Hock, what do you do? You sell the farm. So, by the mid-1990s, the developing nations are stripping themselves of any natural resources they happen to have to pay off their debts, which jump four billion if the interest rates go up by one percent, which they do frequently. And if they've got anything left after that, to pay their fossil fuel bill. Now, about the quickest money raiser around is your friendly local rainforest. All you have to do is cut it down and sell it. The Japanese are crazy for tropical hardwood and will take anything you chop. This in turn causes massive increase in greenhouse gas because the missing trees no longer absorb carbon dioxide. And the fertilizer you now have to put in the forest clearing to make things grow there emits another greenhouse gas, nitrogen dioxide. But after a while, with the trees all gone, the soil is no good whatever you put on it, so it floods easily and erodes, emitting another greenhouse gas, methane. All this as part of the process by which you turn your local forest into your local desert. Which is why by 1994, half the world's rainforests look like this. And the prediction is that if things go on the same way, there won't be a tropical tree left standing by 2075. So there you are, the late 20th century, top to bottom, Western consumers, East European industrialisers, third world asset strippers. Each one doing their thing, and you'll love this, in the name of what I believe they used to call the good life. But to at least one small group of people, by 1994, the forecast long-term effect of this good life on the planet was looking distinctly unhealthy. Population, 9 billion by 2027 and rising, most of it third world. Economic growth rate, 3% a year. Oil and gas production falls. Coal production goes on rising. Atmospheric carbon emission from fossil fuel rises to 11 billion tons. Methane emission doubles. Carbon emission from deforestation doubles. Result, an average global temperature rise of up to 10 degrees at the equator and nearly 25 degrees at the poles, and all that that brings with it. I said this information mattered to one small group of people. I should have said one group of small people. These, your grandparents, born in 1994, and probably the first generation whose health would be so closely affected by the state of the planet, which, as you have just seen, looked increasingly in need of intensive care, the media got so worried about this, they made their own prognosis. The first indications of the catastrophe to come begin to strike in the last years of the 20th century, when a series of massive droughts ravages the USA, the Ukraine, and the wheat fields of Eastern Europe. Three quarters of the tropical rainforest have now been destroyed. By 2015, attempts at land reform to halt deforestation in South America in trigger major millionaire debt from starvation. World population jumps to 9 billion. Greenhouse effect brings desertification and famine, devastation and death in the summer of 2020 to the Carolinas. Two billion dollars worth of damage in Meanwhile, Sydney. Meanwhile, there are forest fires burning out of control throughout the Mediterranean.
Devastation and loss of property there Canton, is tagged in Cairo, Dhaka, and parts of London in 2024 as sea rise reaches over three well, feet. Well, considering their technology back then, that wasn't really all that inaccurate, was it? The numbers were a bit high, that's all. But where they got it really wrong was the argument about whether or not the greenhouse effect was actually happening at the time, which was irrelevant. The question was, what to do about the fact that scientific opinion thought that it would strike sooner or later. Still, for some people, that wasn't good enough reason to spend money preparing for the eventuality. Even though they paid to ensure their lives, their homes, and their national defense against much less likely events. Mind you, greenhouse insurance wasn't going to come easy. It would involve cutting back drastically on energy use and restructuring the world's economy to fit, getting the third world to hold back on development, if they would, and handling whatever disruption Greenhouse itself might bring. One solution had already been suggested in a 1989 Dutch government report. Five years later, it was on the UN agenda. Like medicine, it was hard to swallow, but effective. It looked at the problem in terms of time. Stopping the greenhouse effect by cutting fossil fuel use dead would be economic suicide. But how long could they take to do that? It would need an immediate halving of global carbon emissions from 6 billion down to 3 billion tons a year for the next 100 years to hold the average global temperature rise to about 8 degrees by the year 2100. In 1994, at the UN, delegates heard how that could be done. The total global carbon budget over the century to 2100 would be 300 billion tonnes. Split that 50-50 between the industrialised nations and the third world, and then divide that out based on each country's average emission, say back in 1990, and the size of their adult population. That gave everybody a fixed share of carbon, and how long it took to use it up would depend on their rate of emission. And that's when some people got a shock. At her rate, Portugal, for instance, had 111 years worth. But even super-efficient Japan only had 82 years left. The US would run out of her carbon emission rights in only 11 years. And look at Luxembourg. And the rest of the industrialized world was in the same kind of trouble. The answer to this problem lay with the third world. Large populations and lack of industry gave them tons of spare carbon rights they didn't need. So third world countries with carbon rights they were never going to use could swap them with industrialized countries not for money but for things like reforestation programs, expertise and education programs, alternative energy systems, agricultural know-how and so on. And with this kind of deal everybody was a winner. The third world got the know-how it could never otherwise have afforded, and all the industrialized nations got the extra carbon emission rights they needed. In other words, the industrial world bought time, and the rest got the technology to leapfrog past fossil fuel use directly to the new generation of renewable energy systems. Anybody broke the agreement? Nobody did business with them. So now you can have yourself a timetable. The advanced nations cut emissions 75% by 2030, and the third world catches up with those levels by 2050. I mentioned medicine. Here's the medicine. To pay for a fund to help the third world get started on this plan, any time an industrialized country uses fossil fuel, it pays an extra 6% tax into the fund. Well, you can imagine how the first world sitting here in the UN reacted to that proposition. <coughs> But after all, they were the people who'd created the greenhouse problem in the first place. So when did they go for it? No. 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 2000. that decision until 2000 was, as you'll see, to trigger the beginning of a major change in the balance of power. And I suppose a long-term change in lifestyles too. Because of the advantage the delay would give 
to the Eastern Pacific Rim countries, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, and above all, Japan. Meanwhile, why did it take the international community those six years to make up its mind? Because most governments ignored the key fact that the scientists had no doubt that the greenhouse effect would happen. They just didn't know exactly when and exactly how much. But to most of the world's politicians, if you couldn't identify and quantify a problem, you couldn't do anything about it. So most of them sat in their hands. Well, to be fair, some action was taken. Reports were written. And from 1994 to 1996, a lot of talk happened. And then, unfortunately, reality intervened with a series of the worst droughts in living memory in the summers of 97 and 98. The effects were devastating. The problem was, back then, American grain fed most of the world, and the reserves usually lasted about 90 days. This time, as the farms began to fail, the reserves went down to just 40. The price went up four times. Third world mobs went on the rampage. Thousands of death by riot, followed by hundreds of thousands of death by starvation. end of the century, the problem shifted out of the third world refugee camps and into comfortable western living rooms. In 1999, the US was stopped in its tracks by a third catastrophic drought that dried up all the rivers and water holes, wiped out half the country's farmers, and for the first time in her history, the US was short of food. It was perhaps no coincidence, given this situation, that the Pacific Rim, led by Japan, really started to flex their economic muscle in the political arena, pushing hardest of all for greenhouse action, because whatever happened, they would win. If the rest of the world decided to cut back on fossil fuel use, and especially oil, that would be nothing but good news for the Pacific Rim. Japan was four times as energy efficient as the West already, and only burning half the fossil fuel she'd been burning 20 years before. So, while the West retooled away from fossil fuel, the Pacific Rim could grab the markets. That may be one reason why the first full-scale planetary management computer model was Japanese design. Then, events accelerated. Three major military confrontations in the Persian Gulf began to change people's attitudes to fossil fuel. In 1999, multinational troops were back in the Middle East again. And by this time, the US was importing more than half the oil she used. Which is why this was to be the turning point in the whole story. Squeezed between drought, fuel dependence and political pressure, the US finally joined the international greenhouse effort. And that tipped the balance. The way was now clear for a new international agency that would tackle the twin problems of greenhouse effect and energy worldwide. So early in 2000, that agency, the Planetary Management Authority, was inaugurated. And yes, you guessed it, its headquarters were here on the Eastern Pacific Rim. It had taken them 43 long years since that first greenhouse effect warning back in 1957 and that delay was to prove meaningful but with the PMA up and running they could now get that planetary carbon budget thing going so technology for carbon deals were going on all over the place the US with Burkina Faso Japan with Arunda Burundi Luxembourg with anybody economically backward totally unknown third world countries suddenly found themselves and their problems center stage and their debts 
cancelled. The only reason the new PMA worked was because it was in everybody's interests. That's why, from the start, it was getting data from every major international source. So it was able to coordinate research and provide planet-wide database access to everybody. So, the dreaded greenhouse effect had succeeded in getting some action because it was a double opportunity. For third world countries to phase out fossil fuel they couldn't afford anyway. And for the industrial countries to develop alternate energy resources that would make them independent of oil supplies. Before the end of that year, they knew they were right. When the PMA issued its first status report, produced by that new Japanese planetary management model. You may recall the headlines. Archive status report 2000. Average global temperature plus 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Expected at 3 degrees by 2010. Sea level plus 1 foot. Forecast. Repeated African droughts, increasing tropical hurricanes, rapidly growing global refugee problem. No accurate data yet on the deep ocean reaction to greenhouse. Okay, time to move on. Everybody in 2050 remembers this beautiful Australian beach for the worst possible reason. Here in 2010, along the coast from the city of Darwin, came the action that was to give this decade the bloody name it has in the history books. A pity when you think about how well they'd been doing up to that point. Back in 2002, the first thing the PMA had done was to make the Atmosphere Fund international. And to pay for that, the second thing they'd done was to put the wind up everybody about what those planetary forecasts meant. Within one year of these broadcasts, Western fossil fuel taxes were doubled and an international task force was formed to go all out for renewable energy systems. And the public paid up. Energy independence was the new catchphrase. The media campaign had worked. But the real trouble for most people with this great planetary plan approach was, OK, you cut back on the oil and the coal and the gas. And how do you stop the lights going out? Not to mention the economy. Well, there were two answers to that question, and I'm standing on one of them. Renewable energy. This is a local mini-scale hydroelectric dam, and there were thousands of potential sites for this kind of thing all over the third world. You could even get one small enough to run your own home. Instant energy, zero greenhouse. Here was another trick. Wind power over just the US alone was equal to about 870 billion barrels of oil a day. Matter of fact, high-tech wind farms like these would end up generating 10% of world energy needs at half the cost. 
and the country short of land, put them out to sea. On the other hand, this was the stuff the Third World had coming out of its ears back then. It's called biomass. Stuff like corn and rice husks, sugar cane, above all, dead wood. Nature's garbage, if you like. You pulp up biomass and it makes great fuel. And if you grew plantations of fast-growing trees on marginal land, there was your fuel source. And if you replanted the trees as fast as you used them, they absorbed the carbon you released by burning the biomass. And how about dung? Don't laugh. All you had to do was leave it alone to ferment, and it made fuel gas by the tonne. You could also get greenhouse-free geothermal power from hot water and steam just by digging a hole in the ground, especially along the Pacific Rim. That's why China was able to cut back on coal so soon. But by far the most promising renewable was solar power. Back then there were two kinds. This one's solar thermal power. You reflect sunlight onto pipes filled with oil, and the boiling hot oil then turns water into steam that turns a turbine and gives you electricity. On any scale, from mega power to farmyard. And zero greenhouse. But because it needed direct sunlight, its use was a bit limited. That's why we have these things all over the deserts in 2050. Solar cell technology was a lot more flexible. All you need here is light. It hits electrons in the silicon cell, the electrons move, and basically that's electricity. And by 2003, they were mass producing strips of this stuff cheap. Power on any scale you chose, no matter how remote the site. And because they also worked in cloudy weather, you could use them all around the planet. You cover land the size of Nevada with these things, and they would generate enough electricity to meet the world's demand. And no greenhouse. There was one other way to cut back without pain, besides renewable energy, and that was to get efficient. I know it looks quaint, but back then, this zero greenhouse, energy efficient dwelling was the latest. The irony was, all the technology in here was already generally available to cut home energy use in half, and that was quite a saving. Buildings were using the equivalent of OPEC's entire oil production every year, and putting 900 million tons of carbon into the atmosphere in doing so. You crack that problem, and you could really drink to success. So take a look at some of the things they could do, even back then. Heated cavity walls made in new high insulation materials, modularized environment control hardware, and all run from your own energy management screen. What will the weather be like? Forecast for today, variable cloudiness with some sunshine. There is a chance for a couple of showers or a thunder shower. High temperature 75 to 80. Tonight, Thank you. Give me environmental control for the ground floor of the house. If the temperature rises above that, cool it down to that. And while you're at it, close the blinds. The blinds are now closed. And while we're on the subject of windows, you could have double glazing, light-sensitive film that would cut your energy budget by letting light in but not heat out, or you could keep hot sunlight out like this. Want to see it again? Speaking of hot light, ever seen one of these? It's an old 20th century incandescent. These things used to use 90% of their power, making heat. The new warm light compact fluorescence that they brought in around 2000 lasted 10 times longer, used about a quarter of the power, and put these things back in the museum. Because the new replacements saved 1,500 pounds of carbon emission at the power plant. And that was the trick. Energy efficiency saved you from having to build extra power plants, and that cut back on greenhouse effect. Here's a perfect example. Back in the year 2000, 
These new fridges were seven times more efficient than the ones before. 250 million of these in the third world would save you enough electricity to save you from having to build $90 billion worth of coal-powered generating plant or $200 billion worth of nuclear. Giving these away costs you $6 billion. Made sense. Well, as you know, all this caught on like a house on fire, if you'll forgive the phrase. New indoor amusements became all the rage, like playing with your house. Close the blinds. Play some music. I said all the technology was already there to use. So how did they get people to use it? Well, they gave the power companies tax breaks for giving this stuff to their customers. They doubled the price of energy to reflect its true social costs, but with efficiency, we're only using half anyway. And if you were efficient, you got a cheaper mortgage. Meanwhile, outside, the greenhouse effect continued. On third world coastlines, you either got out of there or the hurricanes would kill you. If you were one of the 30 million people in Mexico City, you had no water. Bombay was one giant epidemic. In 2007, the PMA made family planning programs mandatory because cutting the population would cut back on energy use. Some third world countries ignored the rule until they lost their carbon trading rights. From 2008, a dozen major tropical storms in two years rolled over Bangladesh, northern Australia, the Caribbean, and Florida, wrecking everything in their path and costing hundreds of thousands of lives. But that's not why I'm here in a graveyard. You remember that incident I mentioned at the Australian beach? That was at the end of the decade when the refugee problem exploded. In 2010, a total of two million people tried and failed to cross the now militarized frontiers of the northern Mediterranean, the Mexican-American border, and in the worst incident, that beach at Darwin, when a quarter of a million Indonesians, many of them armed, tried to come ashore along 20 miles of coastline. The Australians had no choice but to fire if fired upon, which of course they were. It took 12,000 casualties to persuade the boat people to go home, and most of them never made it back home alive. There are refugee graveyards like this all over Southeast Asia. Meanwhile, if you still had a car, too bad. Governments began to copy what the Italians had done in Milan back in the 1990s. They slapped massive charges on anybody driving into the cities. Mind you, with traffic like this, you didn't do too much of that anymore. And anyway, with telecommunication costs dropping like a stone, more and more people were already working from home, coming into town only once a week or so. So the car wasn't the business essential it used to be. So that cleared the way for another idea you know very well in 2050. This, which was why the cities themselves began to change. Because those higher energy taxes I mentioned paid for extensive new high-tech underground mass transit systems. Clean, too. By this time, the world was just beginning to look like our world. In 2008, a series of major accidents at nuclear power stations around the world brought the decision that nuclear phase-out was probably a good idea. By 2009, carbon emission trading was already buying the third world expertise and technology transfer in eco-agriculture, industrial management, power generation, family planning, reforestation. In 2010, the next PMA status report came out. Temperature plus three degrees, sea level plus one foot two inches. Carbon emission reductions on target. Technology transfer to the third world accelerating. 
special relationships developing between America and Africa, Europe with Russia and South America, China with Japan. Over two million deaths from starvation. Forecast. High temperatures in Siberia, Western Canada, New Zealand. Continuing droughts, American grain failure, increasing death by starvation, more extreme weather. Temperature rise by 2020, expected at 5 degrees. There is still no news on the deep ocean. Okay, the next decade. 2010 to 2020 was when local energy systems really began to change things. In the industrialized countries, people started moving out of the cities to live and work in small communities. Some of the more developed small third world countries were becoming energy independent for the first time ever. And with major advances in telecommunications, like the new optical switching systems everybody uses today, half the people in the West were now working electronically from their homes out in the country. So business travel was way down, so the skies were empty. Work patterns were changing too. Forestry was the coming thing, and the cowboy was a vanishing breed. This was one of the new integrated mini ranches. Well, some people might call them a beef museum on account of the fact that this was the decade when we finally stopped eating beef. I mean, only really seriously rich people do this in 2050. Okay, let's take a look at what was going on up to 2020. The first problem concerned the most fundamental resource on the planet, water. The old 20th century supply systems couldn't cope with the new conditions. Major rivers in Russia and the US ran dry. In the Middle East, the country at the head of one river shut off supplies to the two downstream countries, and they sent in fighter bombers to turn the water back on. Even 20th century high tech wasn't good enough now. The flood barriers built back in the 20th century, like this one in London, were reaching their limits. That same year, there were thousands of miles of seawalls going up in Australia, Bangladesh and Indonesia. And if you lived on some Pacific islands, you were already swimming. This was the other hot news from the ocean. Here's a PMA satellite view of the annual spring plankton growth happening. And their trick was, they sucked three billion tons of carbon a year out of the atmosphere. Kept the world cool. Not anymore. Now, with the temperature up, they were dying off. So the carbon was staying in the air heating us up more. But the news was better from what used to be the frozen north. If you were a Canadian or a Siberian, your grain output was rocketing. And this year, your delivery troubles were over because for the first time, the Arctic ports were free of ice year round. In America and Europe, by now they were losing whole regions of crop and forest to the heat. And in solar-powered experimental labs like these, Emergency research programs were trying desperately to develop new strains that would grow in hotter, drier conditions. They succeeded. That's when they developed the cactus potato you love to hate in 2050. I mentioned forestry. That's because this really was the decade of the trees. With the plankton gone from the oceans, the forests were the only other hope for taking carbon out of the atmosphere that we could do much about. Third world deforestation was way down. And they'd traded their carbon emissions for some of the most advanced forestry techniques in the world. Techniques that were changing what a forest was. Look, this is about to be a fancy trick that not all of you may be familiar with. Because this is not what it appears to be. Down here, a coca plantation, but up there, a pine forest. Agroforestry, it was called. And all over the third world, it was taking the form of extractive reserves, where you plant stuff like rubber, palm oil, coffee, food trees, coca. But you plant them inside the forest, so you get two bites of the cherry, so to speak, the forest and the product. 
And alongside this mix and match, the straight 800,000 square mile global tree replant program that would eventually suck 780 million tons of carbon emission out of the air every year. In every sense of the word, as I said, forestry had become a growth industry. Well, in some places, it wasn't. Particularly in South America, where the PMA had its first military confrontation. Down here, there'd been a vicious guerrilla war going on for 50 years, ever since the local cattle barons had grabbed thousands of acres of farmland for ranches. In 2019, the PMA hit the governments involved with carbon trading sanctions, backed up by an international sea and air blockade. It worked. South American land reform was forced through, and the guerrillas started coming back out of the forests. And with land reform came the real end of deforestation. The 2020 PMA status report was mixed news. Well, at least deforestation was now off the agenda. Status report 2020. Temperature rise is at plus 5.4 degrees and sea level plus 2 feet. Western fossil fuel use down by half, steady in developing countries. Forecast. Major vegetation loss is in the US, Europe, southern Russia. Continuing worldwide water shortages. Long-term sea level rise. There is still no good data on the deep ocean reaction. So, those forests were finally safe. Half gone, mind you, but safe. Protected, it must be said, by the sky-high taxes on beef that had already begun to shut down the great South American ranches oh, as early as 2012 that put pay to the great American hamburger and cut the methane emission from flatulent cows. Okay, one more stop before the modern world. China, 200 million have been flooded out. 50 million refugees in Bangladesh, and a fifth of the country gone. Unfortunately, most of the half billion people at risk worldwide from sea rise lived in the third world. Egypt, for instance, has lost half its industry. A lot of the North European manufacturing centers have either gone or they're on stilts. And if you own property in southern Florida, well, now you don't. The closer we've been getting to the mid-century target date, the more the PMA's been churning out status reports on the effect of their 50 years of crisis management. Because that's really what it's been all along. And you know the result. It's cost 20 million deaths from starvation and flood. Fortunately, there was just that one nuclear exchange in the Middle East. They went through that 10-year recession after 2000 and the fossil fuel cutback, but they came out of it with renewable power systems and the energy independence that gave every country. Of course, we still have local wars over raw materials, but the worldwide conflicts of the old oil dependence days are gone for good. We've reached the fossil fuel cutback target, okay, mainly because the PMA vets everybody's energy use now. The big difference is in the way we live, I suppose, because the real international commodity now is knowledge. And that's where that old 20th century Japanese attitude to education really paid off, especially in the new China-Japan Federation.
But it really doesn't matter where you come from now. There's nowhere on earth you can be out of touch today. So most people live in small towns and villages. Self-sustaining is the buzzword these days. And as for how the world looks, well, the 20th century wouldn't recognize it, would it? We've got a lot of forests and forests of solar panels. Scotland wasn't always like this. Nor was Kansas. Or Central Australia. Or the Riviera. Or even Massachusetts. So, there it is. I guess all in all the PMA gets mixed reviews. But what else would you expect? It took 50 years to change people's habits. The hardest thing of all has been getting everybody to recognize our common interest. Come to think of it, Inner Mongolia still doesn't. But I suppose the real long-term global social effect of Greenhouse will turn out to be what it did to the old third world. When previously isolated communities all over the planet can plug into the world's communication systems and satellite education programs because now they have the technology in the form of local independent solar energy systems that give new meaning to the old 20th century saying. You remember? Power to the people. Okay, quit. Well, here we are back in the real reality of 2050. I hope you were impressed by the magic machine here. You'd better be. We're going to be needing it. Come out to the PMA data center and I'll show you what I mean. You see what I meant about virtual reality being as good as real reality? You can't tell the difference. Except real reality, this, we have to live with. I mean, of course, the new planetary forecast that came out today. In a way, the purpose of this whole program has been to lead to it because they finally got the data on that deep ocean reaction. The reaction, you recall, that was always going to take 50 years to show through. So I don't suppose there was much the PMA could have done about it anyway. Still, never mind the excuses. Take a look. This is the ocean circulation system called the Atlantic Conveyor. Normally, warm Gulf Stream water going up the surface of the Atlantic is evaporated by the winds up here. That makes it saltier and heavier, so it sinks to the bottom and pulls more warm Gulf Stream water north from the tropics to fill the gap it leaves behind. That sinking mechanism drives the whole system along. Now, just suppose the conveyor slowed down. With less warm water coming north, the temperature should drop, right? But the greenhouse effect has changed all the rules, because now there's a massive amount of extra carbon in the atmosphere. Every year, 100 billion tons is absorbed by the ocean, is drawn down from the surface by the conveyor when the Gulf Stream sinks, and is dumped at the bottom of the ocean. Was drawn down. Was dumped. Because now, it looks as if this is happening. Some things affected the conveyor. With the global change in the weather, all that rainfall and melting sea ice have diluted the North Atlantic Gulf Stream, so it's now much less salty than it used to be. The whole system has slowed down, taking less carbon down, leaving more in the air to warm us up more over the next 50 years at least, maybe twice as much. So you know what that means. Real carbon cutbacks. Emission levels down to where they were in 1800, before the Industrial Revolution. I think we're going to be a planet covered in trees. I wonder what that'll be like. You know, your crazy great-grandparents from the 20th century would never have fitted in here with their uncontrolled, do-your-own-thing lifestyle. <laughs> too little, too late, all that did for us. But I suppose some good did come out of it. We have a world we take care of, a Pacific Rim world, clean, high-tech, efficient, renewable, community-conscious, above all, orderly. Still, it's a pity you can't rewrite history, isn't it? We might have avoided so much of it. Especially those 20 years between 1980 and 2000, when all they did was argue about whether or not they wanted planetary insurance. I was thinking about that the other day, you know, the 20th century attitude towards things. The attitude that's caused us all this grief. <laughs>
It always reminds me of that joke about the fellow who falls off a skyscraper. You know it? I think it explains everything that's happened. The fellow is falling past the 17th floor, and somebody calls out to ask him how he's doing. And he shrugs and says, so far, so good. So the 20th century left the problem to us, and we nearly solved it. But it was a close-run thing, wasn't it? And it didn't have to be.